Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast. This is your host, Tyler Yonke, episode 139, Crazy Tour de France edition. We're going to discuss today stages 16 through 19, get you caught up on that, do some analysis and commentary. Look, riders are fighting. They're getting sent home from the tour. Just as the weather changes in Thibaut Pino's favor, he says, F it, I'm out of here. It's a Colombian invasion at the Tour de France. Look, just as the tour is starting to strain their neck to be able to see Paris, we now have a total transition. Is the race still decided? Do we know who's coming up? Look, we'll do some things to make it go home, some predictions, some winners and losers. It makes me wonder, what happened in 1985 to make God hate France so much? We'll discuss it coming up next. All right, so look, should we start off with God hating France? <laughs> it looks like maybe that's the issue. Today, stage 19, we will get right to, we'll, we'll talk about that, but we're going to kind of, once again, go back to stages 16, 17, 18. We'll do a real quick recap of that, and then we'll talk about all the drama that happened today in the Tour de France. Weird weather, weird people exiting, well, no, I'm not saying Thibaut Pino is weird, but weird circumstances. Look, every day we've said this is a three-week race, and from day one, you know, this person looks good. Uh, Julian Alaphilippe is a good, actually, all the way along. He's struggled lately, but he's still been looking good, firing rockets off. Thibaut Pino was looking exceptional going off with Julian Alaphilippe early on and then taking the grains uh, up in the mountains in the Pyrenees. You know, remember when he was up uh, rocketing out there to a stage win, flicking his elbow for uh, Bernal to come through. Bernal's like, I can't do it. And he just attacks again and he goes off. He was the guy that we were saying, hey, look, if you can get rid of Julian Alaphilippe, we expected to have that happen. Pino is your man. And everyone has been picking him. But things change. Next thing you know. Bernal starts to look good. Kreuzwick kind of in the mix. Then Garrett Thomas is looking bad. He's looking good. And then you have Movie Star. What, what is up with Movie Star? Well, we'll talk about all those things. So remember, last we heard, Steve, uh, Simon Yates gets a third stage win for uh, Mitchell and Scott. Pretty, uh, pretty good uh, announcing win uh, in the mountains. Uh, stage 16 was Nimes to Nimes. It was just 177 kilometers circuit race. You expect this to be a... Uh, true sprinter stage and what you had in the end was cable viewing blasting out of the pack that, that came down to the finish there's lead outs for uh, i had said before i didn't think viviani was going to be going through this because he had started to do a lot of work for uh, K, uh for his team um julian alaphilippe his who's in the yellow jersey what happened was you actually saw a quick step on the front doing a decent amount of work and they did a, a lead out train for him caleb ewing gets pushed in the back he's like six eight guys back but he launches himself pretty early and just rockets himself out, takes the win, the wind, and the win, pretty convincing fashion. Uh, I think he got up to like 40 miles an hour in the sprint. Uh, Viviani actually holds on for second place. Dylan Gronewagen, not quite the the sprinter that you would hope for, uh, or the battle that you saw with Caleb Ewan before. So Caleb Ewan gets his second win of the Tour de France, uh, going away, and uh, he was pretty happy about that. Um, all of, of course, all of his teammates gave him the high fives, everything you would expect. Caleb Ewing still had Julian Alaphilippe, no changes in the overall general classification uh, for uh, after stage 17, 16, I'm sorry. Stage 17, point de garde to Gap. Now, this Gap is a famous uh, city as far as the tour goes. A lot of times they come into this town uh, at kind of a transition and they'll end up there uh, right before they go into the Alps. This was uh, no different. It had a little cat four and then a cat three before the finish down into the town of gap and look uh this one was a breakaway you had mateo trenton comes out uh, mitchelton scott gets their fourth stage win of the tour uh mateo trenton he's kind of a pack sprinter not really a pack sprinter he's a breakaway sprinter he does well you know look uh, I think, what, two years ago in the Vuelta, he got four stage wins. Some of those were kind of in a breakaway. I think two of them were in a breakaway. Two of them were in a field sprint. But, you know, this is not quite the same sprinters, and they get diminished there from some of those climbs. So he's he's just kind of one of those riders for Mitchell and Scott. Mitchell and Scott comes out ever after having Adam Yates not be able to contest the overall, and they just they do what they do, and they've had a tremendous tour uh, it, with Simon, MP, 
and uh, now Matteo Trenton. Matteo Trenton is the reigning European road race champion, so he wears that uh, interesting jersey. Anyway, there was uh, a little... The breakaway that day had, I don't know, 8, 10, 15 minutes, something like that. And what you ended up (laughs) from behind, they're coming into the last climb up. And there was some fear that perhaps Julian Alaphilippe would, you know, take a little bit of a launch. So you have two teams. You have Team Jumbo Visma and you have uh, Ineos. And I'm sure everyone's seen the video of this, but watching it at the time, um, Luke Rose coming up on the right side. Uh, Tony Martin for Jumbo Visma is on the front and he doesn't want him to be in the front. I think they were just all jostling trying to get their team riders in position and tony martin is kind of pushing him over into dirt kind of looking to see which way he's going and it's intentional i mean it was a three times swerve to make sure luke rowe wasn't coming past him or to push him off into the dirt it looked pretty bad at the time uh those two guys come over the line i guess they're like uh, okay shaking hands or something like this but what in- inevitably happened was the, the uci jury you know like there's cameras everywhere nowadays you can't get away with it, especially when you're doing this on the front and uh, they both get disqualified. A little bit more review shows that Luke Rowe had actually been, after this incident, had grabbed the jersey of Tony Martin and uh, trying to push him around. You even look at more videos, and why was Tony Martin even doing this? Well, before that, you have on the right-hand side as the, the field is going, left-hand as you're looking at it on TV from the front, um, Luke Rowe is kind of gets himself third position uh, behind the Jumbo Visma guys. And all of a sudden, he just decides he wants to go way left into the middle of the peloton. And he just starts squeezing out Kreuzwick. And I don't think that made um, Tony Martin very happy. And it was kind of a, a weird move. I mean, I know, look, they say it's hot. These guys are getting worked up about it. Um, but, you know, look, we all we all can have stressful jobs. You, can, you can't just go around assaulting people. And look. Uh, Dale Braille, Dave uh, Brailsford, uh, the general manager of Ineos, is kept saying, you know, look, this is this was a red card, like an ejection. They should have only had a yellow card. Um, I don't know. Do you want to compare it to soccer or football? Uh, I think that's it's not the same. It's not the same rules. I mean, guys in, in soccer all the time, they, they fall down with their, you know, faking the leg hurting all these things let's not compare with that or someone else is saying hey look in hockey there's yes those are that's part of the the culture of the sport um and i understand there's there's part of this sport you know look there's there's two things one is take the hands off the handlebars for luke Rowe. that's you're not supposed to do that but i almost think and and but the action on the bike of intentionally trying to crash someone out i don't care if it's at a uh, you know slow speed or not that's pretty uh, egregious and you've got to you've got to basically boot these guys out of the race remember last year johnny moscon uh for ineos or then it was team sky uh was punching a rider uh i think it was for fdj trying to remember his name uh anyway he was throwing a bottle at him and you know right at the front of the race once again they're not good criminals so they don't do this in the right fashion they got dq'd these both guys get dq'd with all these mountain stages coming up and team ineos not quite the where they have been before this could potentially be a, a, a downfall for both of these but the the benefit they have is the weak weak team of Dequanic quick step when it comes to defending the overall and the gc the general classification and their rider in the yellow jersey julian alaphilippe they're diminished so they don't need to worry uh the ineos and jumbo uh as long as they're able to get rid of alaphilippe in the mountains when he doesn't have a team anyway that's not going to hurt them as much so they don't need quite as strong a team but i'm sure they will like it but after stage 19, you know, that may come into to effect on the, the last day. So that was stage 17. There was no change in the general classification. Um, Alaphilippe said when he saw those two guys, you know, freaking out and, you know, kind of going at each other, he's, he made some comments like, look, I'm not calm down. I'm not going to attack. Just everybody calm down. You know, <laughs> let's not crash anybody out here. OK, stage 18. This is day one of the final three big days in the Alps. This was Embrun to Valor, 207 kilometers. This happened on Thursday. Uh, the only problem with this outline, and I was talking to Kurt Mills, uh, podcast partner here about it, and he was not looking forward to the the fact that they're ruining this stage, uh, heads up to an HC climb, and then it has a you know 20 kilometer descent down to the finish. Yeah, you're right. It changes things. Uh, riders are going to do things differently to the peak. Are they? They're not going to because the race is down the bottom, so they still have to put out a lot of energy. And we'll talk about what actually happens there. But with that being the case, they don't race to the top with the same vigor and emptying the tank as they would normally. And I think you can kind of see how that that plays out. So it kind of diminishes some of the 
the lure of the race and uh, the excitement, hopefully, you know, carnage on GC. But those that are hoping for Alaphilippe, this was a prime stage for them to, to still be able to hold on to hope. Okay. Have a cat three, a cat one, an HC, an HC, and then drop down into Velour. What you have early on is a fairly b sizable break, and Nairo Quintana of Movie Star gets in this break. That break at going up to the Izuard, which is a second to last climb on the day, an HC break has uh, about 845. Uh, so he's close to virtual yellow at that point. His own team, Movie Star, decides that they're going to get in place and they're going to bring that back. There's no one else in that break. There's Roman Bardet. Uh, there's really no one at all that's threatening on the overall GC. I think there were some Ineos riders, but some Movie Stars. Uh, but they're they're working. Movie Star is working, and they bring that break. By the time that they go over the top of the Izuard with uh, Bardet, Mike Woods, um, Nairo Quintana. Uh, I'm not sure if who else was it. the point is when they went over the, the top of the Izuard, they had brought that break down to around four some minutes. So they'd cut four minutes off of the lead to Nairo over the top. Now, look, so Nairo ends up going into the last uh, climb. He punches it up the Galibier. He actually has a time a minute faster than all the other riders going over that. Comes down the finish. He ends up winning the stage. Great. He moves up to like fifth place overall. It takes, you know, five different places. He moves up. Uh, is like four something out. He moves ahead of his own teammate, uh, Landa. And you're like, look, if they hadn't have brought him back, he might have been really close to yellow. Yeah. So this is what's interesting is, and, and you saw on the day as well. We'll talk, let's actually get into what happened with the general classification guys. So Bernal, uh, Nairo ends up winning the stage, but he's not typically a huge threat to the overall at that moment but they don't give him too much leash they bring him back like i said he wins by about four or five minutes but the action on the on the final climb up the de is it starts off with bernal attacking but he attacks maybe 4k to the top maybe a little less than that and when he goes it's not like a harsh attack he just kind of rides up the word is that uh his teammate garen thomas said look I want you to stir the pot. Let's get some action going here. You attack. I expect it to kind of just shred up. Well, it didn't really do that. Uh, the other riders just kind of meandered their way. And at the top, there, then Bernal, about, I'd say about a K and a half, Garrett Thomas. Now, Bernal at the time has about a 45-second gap on them. And now Thomas takes the attack. He does actually get a gap. But behind, you still have Bookman. He's chasing. You have Tito, Thibaut Pino. He's chasing. Uh, Iran's, I think, is in there. Uh, Port's flailing around the back. Julian Alaphilippe is there. Obviously, Kreuzwick. Uh, and, and Alaphilippe starts to flail. He has to come around to Port, or Port comes around him. And Thomas is still having a little gap. And right before the top, uh, the Pino, Kreuzwick group, Landa, they connect with uh, Garrett Thomas. So he really doesn't do any pulling on them. But that gap to Bernal does decrease by about 15 seconds. They have about a 30-second gap over the top. And that actually stays somewhere in that range till the finish. They have 30, 15 seconds or so over 30 to 15 seconds, somewhere in that range over Alaphilippe. And he goes breakneck on this descent. Now, look, there's a little wetness down there. People are making a big issue about the fact that he had disc brakes probably good for the way I mean, he, he descends like a maniac anyway he does really well he catches up to the group he goes straight through them he almost he tries to drop them in the end it might have been look it, why waste your energy you've already caught the group you're not going to make up much more time there's they have reason to chase Bernal most of them at least do they haven't really made uh Alaphilippe do the a lot of the work he's had ever on his own on this race they attack him or they go to the front themselves so I wouldn't expect that they, he didn't need to do that in the end, you get uh, Bernal ends up moving himself up into second place, and you had Alaphilippe lose. Oh, I think actually, he stayed with that group uh, that was with uh, everybody on the GC riders. So he catches back up with Thomas. You have Quintana. He gets the win. The smattering of guys that were in the break at, from Ineos. You have Bernal comes in at 446 back. Kreuzwick leads the next group over 518. So, you know, look, they're. 30 seconds or so there to Bernal. He gets a little bit, but that's with Bookman, Chibo Pino, Thomas, Alaphilippe, Rigoberto Uran, Landa, Port, and then Warren Bargui and a few others smattering comes in a little bit later. Look, uh, we're going to just take a look at that. Pino, so like I said before, you know, when we had the, the first up to the second rest day, 
uh, Pino was probably the guy we're going to pick for this overall. I mean, if you can get rid of Julian Alaphilippe, he's the one. But he did not take the reins at all. Well, he, he did pull over the top of it, but you can just tell he didn't quite have the mojo that he had been having uh, in prior days. And it comes out that it, he's been having an issue, and we'll talk about that. Look, the weather. The weather was a big deal because Pino has been notorious and said, I don't like the heat. Uh, I like it cold. I like it, you know, a little more in, in that kind of range. And I don't do as well in the heat. And it's been super hot over there in the hundreds. Uh, and he was kind of laboring, but yet some of that climb had some some rain. So there was, you know, look – I don't know if that's his problem, but we come out that it's actually a, a different and uh, more of a physical issue. St- stage 19, we're looking to look. St- this is this is stage uh, two of the three big stages in the Alps. Tomorrow we have stage 20. It's going to be the 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 big final um, Bruja. But this one, hundred and um, I think it was about 137, 126.5 kilometers. A cat three, a cat two, a cat three, and an HC category, and then up the uh, Isaron, and then they drop down, and then they go up to teens and a cat one finish. Now, the problem though is if you look at the profile, those threes, those two, and that three again, all the way up to the HC, it's pretty much climbing all day. So even though you have a little respite on a few little descents and they have some summits, it's not much. It's it's a big, (laughs) big ass giant climb up to, to kilometer 89. Uh, the fireworks start off early. Uh, there's breaks going up the road. They don't get much, too much time, but it starts to smatter and shatter all over the road. This is the day we're talking about because this is the big, it, there's, there's, and look back once again, um, you know, when, when things happen, Matteo Trenton wins the stage, uh, for Mitchell and Scott should be the big news, but the big news that day was Luke Rowe and Tony, um, Tony Martin acting like children on their bike. Today we have, uh, you know, should be a big day with Bernal and another GC and Julian Alaphilippe. What's going to happen with them? But what happens is early on, uh, Thibaut Pinot, he's pulling over to the side. He's going to the doctor. Uh, they're spraying some stuff on his leg. He's taken off a bandage. So evidently he's had it. Well, it comes out that he had some sort of leg uh, muscle lesion. So maybe like a, a strained muscle. He said he hit it on the handlebars trying to avoid a wreck two days prior. And it's been pretty bad. Matter back to the point where he... Early on, he is struggling big time. He's losing minutes. You can tell he's spinning harshly. Everyone's passing him. His teammates kind of patting him on the back. So the team all knew what it was because no one was stopping for him. Um, he starts hugging one of his big, he's crying. He starts hugging one of his big uh, riders on his team there, you know, a guy that he never sees in the mountains. And he, uh, he, he crawls off the bike, gets out, he's crying in the car. You know, pretty bad day for France on that point. Uh, up in the break, there's a little bit of a break. Rigoberto Uran, Rigoberto Uran, he's the lead rider as far as GC goes in there, but that break never gets more than you know maybe two minutes or so. And then the uh, look, the stage gets canceled today. Uh, we'll talk. Sorry to spoil it, but that's everyone probably knows about that in the, in anyway. So it's a good thing that all the leaders decided to attack on the Izuan prior to the penultimate, the, the final big climb at the day at teens. Because if they hadn't have, they would have had a, a very, very big missed opportunity. And you see Garrett Thomas about halfway up the climb or so, he decides to attack. It's probably what he needed to do instead of yesterday. He doesn't get much of a gap. Kreuzewick comes up to him. Kreuzewick attacks. Now you're starting to see Alaphilippe distance. And with that, Bernal's on his wheel. Then Bernal easily goes around. He gets up to the group, and then he goes through it. Bernal's gone. Uh, he starts getting remnants of the break. Next thing you know, he's riding with Adam Yates or Simon Yates, who'd been up in the break. He has just, he's drilling away. He's getting further and further. Uh, you have Kreuzwick with De Plus. He is leading the fight. You start to see Port going out the back. Alaphilippe is doing the best he can. Walt Poles is hanging on with Alaphilippe. He comes around Alaphilippe. He breaks up there. And over the top of the climb, you see uh, Bernal goes over there a little bit ahead of Yates. He's got about 210 on the yellow jersey, about one or so, 110 on Thomas, Kreuzwick, De Plus, Landa, Bookman. And then, like I said, um, Alaphilippe comes flying across. And he's, you know, look, all the commentators are like, oh, look what he did yesterday, that brave descent. He's going to make all his time back up. Well, he would have to make up, you know, minute plus to, uh, to Thomas. He'd have to make up about, uh, you know, two minutes there to, to Bernal. 
suddenly it comes across the news that there's this uh, bad weather. There is a hailstorm down in the valley before they climb the teens. And they, DQ, they, they, they stop the entire race. They pull the plug. The riders are confused. They're still descending mad because breakneck speeds because for them, the weather is just fine. But look, there's like a 300 meter, almost less than a kilometer section where it was massive hailstorm and water came across the road. There's like ice. They're trying to scoop it out. Then further up the climb uh, near getting to teens, there's been uh, showing that there was a full on mudslide. So they would not have been able to do anything. So what did they do? They end up taking the times from the top of the climb with the Israel and everyone is, is kind of weirded out. They're upset. Matter of fact, we haven't even really got full results coming in. So we're still waiting to see what that happens, but they're going to be taking the times from, like I said, the top of uh, the Israel, and that's going to be the final. There was a bonus of eight seconds over the top. There was also going to be a bonus at the finish. I doubt they're going to be giving those times. So here's what you have for that. And this is no times official, but these are what you have for the GC right now. You have Egon Bernal in first place, Julian Alaphilippe in second, Garrett Thomas in third, Kroizuk in fourth, Buckman in fifth, Landa sixth, Ruran in seventh, Quintana, Barqui, Valverde. I, really weird day. I think they probably made the right call due to the fact that that landslide, like, you know, the guys want to ride through the water or that maybe they, they neutralize and set everyone on the other side. Well, then they had this landslide that was, it looks like concrete flowing across the road. So a lot of trouble there. Look, uh, I heard Doug Ryder, the, um, manager for dimension data and he's like look how in this day and this is just weird that this these happen how does this happen in this day and age that you know we can still have these things happen i'm like dude you're in the alps in i don't care if it's summer or winter you know rainstorms are you saying you want to control the weather now uh landslides i mean look you're not you're not talking about giant infrastructure out there this happens you know you can ride on a, you went rode on a freaking dirt road up la ponche of belfi it happens you can't control everything sorry you know, it's the way it is, but we'll have to wait and see, get a little bit more times. I, I think they made the right call due to the fact that, like I said, the road was completely washed out, but it really sucks for some of these riders. So you have Bernal, like let's, let's take a look at kind of breaking down. How would they have possibly ridden differently if the road was, you know, the finish at the top? Look, I, I don't know that you, uh, maybe Bernal gets more time. I don't know that those guys in the break, they could have been maybe closed it down, you know, maybe Alaphilippe says, oh, the finish is right here. I'm really going to go hard and bury myself. But, you know, he still had another climb to go. So he had to measure his efforts. They all did. But maybe like Thomas, maybe Thomas, and, and we'll get to this on our winners and losers, but, um, you know, Thomas may be the a kind of a loser on the day because if he's able to at all, he wasn't doing any work up the climb because he was sitting on. Um, Kreuzwick was, Bachman was doing some work. Uh, you know, Landa was doing some. Uh, and obviously Alaphilippe was having to chase. So if he's just sitting in because his teammates up the road, um, maybe come on that last climb, it's a little more of a power climb. He might be able to get some distance and close down to either Bernal or put more time on Alaphilippe. If Alaphilippe doesn't make connection, which I don't think he was going to make connection to that group, um, take a minute to get back to Thomas, uh, then he's going basically solo through the valley and up the final climb. And that's a lot of work for him. And like I said, Thomas being out there, being able to do his own thing. Nairo Quintana, I mean, he slips down again <laughs> because he got blown out of that group. Uh, Rigoberto Uran is coming up, but he was still having trouble on the climb. I don't see Port anywhere. He's uh, he's had some issues. Kreuzwick, Kreuzwick uh, did attack. He looked pretty good doing that. Uh, then he just kind of had to hold on. You had Duplus uh, out there helping him out. I'm sure some of these guys were somewhat holding on for that final climb still uh, because they still had to obviously go up, but you don't want to blow everything out on the Israel when you still have, you know, to go down a big long descent, some ups and downs, and then the final climb up to the finish. So kind of a bummer all around that we didn't get to see this uh, play out, but you know, it's kind of the, the way it is. What's happening uh, coming up? Well, you have your final race there, 131 kilometers tomorrow, uh, starts from Albertville to Val Thorons. Is a cat one about 33k in uh cat two around the just before 80k and then you have your final pitch up to the finish and, and the deal with this one is it's uh, around 30k it's a 30 kilometer climb 
the the gradient's not super bad it's got some some respite along the way some of the little downs and ups but you pretty much are climbing from kilometer 96 and a half to 130 so that's a, a average of 5.5 it's not a, you know ultimate steep but you're flying along it's the last day of the race uh what will be interesting now is to see with Ineos basically having Bernal in the lead. And I'm not sure exactly by how much. I think it's like maybe 35, 40 seconds. You don't expect Julian Alaphilippe to be able to attack and to take this on because I think he's just been able to de- try to defend at this point. He's you know doing what he can. If he attacks, he's probably going to explode. So are you going to see kind of what we have not seen this whole tour, thank God, and what you've seen for the last seven years, which is just Ineos slash Sky going to the front, and just kind of setting the pace and kind of deadening it for everybody. Uh, I expect with everyone still close proximity, uh, there you know, one of the guys that would have been fun here would have been Thibaut Pino, but obviously he's out, uh, so you don't have that. But you know, Kreuzwick, he doesn't have the jump. I mean, who's gonna maybe maybe have a battle and in fight here? Uh, all a uh, 1986 Bernardino and Greg LeMond with Garrett Thomas and Bernal. I think. That uh, Ineos and, and is not going to be doing that. So, you know, look, I, I don't know what to expect, but it will be interesting. Final big day, and then we have, we say, have a little promenade into Paris on Sunday. How about some things that make you go, hmm? Things that make you go, hmm. Sagan's influence on the weather protocol, extreme weather protocol. The other day when it was super hot, Sagan had come out and said, look, they need to do something. Uh, you know, it's hot. Um, shorten the stages. They need to do something about this weather. We have this uh, union that does nothing. We pay a bunch of money to them and they're not doing any enforcement. And I really, you know, something should happen. Okay. Well, first of all, um, I don't know if he's ever, I'm sure he's raced in, in Tour Down Under. I mean, here in Northern California growing up, you know, we've raced in well over 100 degrees. I mean, it, I don't think it got any hotter than maybe 100, 101 there when they're racing. It sucks. Maybe they could change the time of day. But it sounds like maybe they <laughs> listened to him with today was, uh, uh, you know, the hailstorm that shortened the stage. Uh, Peter, you know, you maybe you got what you wanted. The UCI and the ASO finally listened to you and they shortened the stage due to the extreme weather. Of course, it's not quite what you expected. All right. Winners and losers on the day. In the last few stages, uh, obviously, winner would be Bernal and Ineos. Um, the biggest biggest win i mean bernal last two days in the mountains has just looked spectacular he looks like that bernal that we've seen he's coming into form you know when he was not able to hang with Thibaut pino uh, a few stages ago uh you start to think uh, maybe he's not quite but you know even at the time he was still up the road from everyone else so uh you know he's he's, he's shown he can do it what is he 22 this is pretty scary to think about what might be the next few years the fact that he rides on Ineos and they just back him this whole time uh, maybe kind of a brutal uh, tour to watch. So this has been a very good one because one, he's young, he's coming in there. He, I don't think he had the best season so far. So it put everyone kind of on par, but he shows the potential to be be a big, big time winner. Maybe multiple tours coming up, but you never know. I mean, look what happened with uh, Thibaut Pinot. You bang your, your knee out, your thigh on a handlebar and you're not able to go. Uh, biggest loser, I would say France and Thomas. Um, remember Macron came up there, president of France came up and, uh, had his pictures taken with, uh, Roman Bardet and Pinot. And he was just all excited because, uh, Bardet, I think had the polka dot Jersey and, uh, Thibaut Pinot won a stage and, and, uh, oh, it was actually Julian Alaphilippe because he, he was in the yellow Jersey. So maybe he jinxed them. And he's the one to blame for all this. So France, if you uh, if you want to, really want, you, you guys seem to hate Macron. You can continue hating him. I think him showing up at the race, everything's been downhill since then. So the biggest loser on the day. That. Yeah. How about some predictions? Um, I think you're going to see, without a problem, Bernal is going to win this race, and it may be less than the time frame. He may open it up a little bit more. I think you are going to see Julian Alaphilippe slip away from the podium. <clears throat> I thought if today, if he went into today's stage at the finish with the yellow, there's a good chance he can still win it. I think he's going to slip off of the podium altogether. And you're going to have Kreuzwick and Thomas. But, you know, there may be a good little, we'll have to see what the time gaps are here. Good uh, battle still with Buckman. So 
it may be exciting, you know, if, if Bernal's the guy and maybe they just kind of ignore him and they say, I'm just going to race for a second and throw it all out there in, with that opportunity, uh, you may still see some, some good explosions on the last day. All right. Those are our predictions. We'll, you know, hopefully, look, crazy day, uh, last few days, you know, we said this guy's going to be the winner. No, no, this guy's going to be the winner. All along, Julian Alaphilippe is still hung in there. Uh, we've reduced the top five, six to now just five because Pino is gone. Bummer to see that. He was fighting really well. But, you know, this is the Tour de France, and this is the excitement we're looking for. And so all this drama, daily changes. Nairo's in yesterday. Nairo's out today. Movie star doing their weird tactics yesterday. Now, who knows what's going on? Either way, I'm sure you're going to enjoy stage 20. We'll come back with a full recap, probably stage tw after tw stage 21. We'll do a recap of the entire tour and give you a breakdown of to what we thought, um, not just on a daily basis, but on an overall 30,000 foot perspective once we digested everything. Thanks everyone for joining. This has been episode 139 of the Between Two Wheels podcast. You can check us out on any of the, the platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, Podbeam. We also have a YouTube channel. Check us out there, the Facebook page as well. Give us any of your comments, your concerns, uh, anything you want to say, some critiques. Other than that, thank you for tuning in and cross your fingers for a good race. Brunel, who's going to be? <laughs>